Welcome everybody at this already sixth session of the Green Post Corona Talks, organized by the Green European Foundation. I'm Dirk Holmans, co-president of the foundation, director of the Flemish think tank Oikos, and your host of these talks. And as we learned during previous sessions, people from all over Europe are following these sessions, which is of course great. You are following through live stream on Facebook. And to make it an interactive session, I want to invite people to put questions in the chat box. Uh, you can also ask questions using Twitter with the hashtag uh, Green European Foundation. I see the questions here coming up. And so in the second part of this session, I will ask these questions to the speakers. The topic of this sixth session is the impact of the Corona crisis on mobility. And of course, also on the future of mobility. I don't have to explain you that the Corona crisis has changed our intensity and also our modes of travel a lot. We have airplanes staying on the ground. This week, I took a train here in Belgium from Ghent to Brussels. The train was rather empty, and I see people using much more their bikes. And we all, as we are now experiencing, are working much more from home. And so we see next to some challenges also the positive aspects of working at home, not losing anymore a lot of time while commuting. So let's say there's a challenge of the changed patterns of mobility during this crisis. Uh, and also the question of what kind of mobility do we want after the Corona crisis? And in order to discuss this wide range of issues, we have three really inspiring speakers. First, I'm very happy to introduce Leonore Gwissler, she's Austrian Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. And I also want to add, she was the first director of the Green European Foundation. After her, we have Elke van den Brandt. She's Minister of the Government of the Brussels Capital Region, responsible for mobility, public works and road safety. Last but not least, we have William Tots, Executive Director of Transport and Environment. I first want to give the floor to Leonor, and I would like to ask her first to give a short insight on into the Austrian handling of the pandemic, and then to give us a national perspective on what effects are on the transport sector and mobility. And of course, we also would we really like to hear about uh, the connection between the potential bailout of Austrian airlines in this crisis with climate targets. So Leonor, you have the floor. Thanks a lot. I'm uh, really happy to join you in these uh, post-corona talks, even though we're, um, I fear, still somewhere in the middle of corona. But to have the perspective on what comes next and what comes afterwards and what do we take out of this situation, I think is is paramount. And I think it's just the time now to start the discussion on that. I just come out of a uh, of a meeting with um, a lot of people from the civil society and uh, also entrepreneurs who are currently in the Austrian government. We we host these roundtables to get input, to get ideas, to get perspectives on how do we. And I always have a hard time using this phrase, use this crisis, but in a way, use this moment in time to. Um, to go into the future towards um, managing a current economic and uh, and work uh, of work labor market crisis, but also in using it as a as an opportunity to steer towards the goals that we share in Europe and that we um, that we uh, are committed to in Austria climate neutrality by 2040 or for Europe by 2050. Um, so I will only give you um, three, I would like to touch on three points. The first one is what kind of effects did um, Corona have in uh, the COVID-19 crisis in Austria on the mobility sector, on the transport sector. I will, if you allow, not uh, spend a lot of time on the handling of the crisis because um, the, I try to stay focused on the issue because otherwise I will talk, I fear, for half an hour. and. I'd be much more interested to hear also the Brussels perspective and, and the civil society perspective on this. So um, first point, um, what were the effects? Second, what kind of emergency measures did we take? And third point, where to go from, from here? What are the challenges now? 
So um, on the first point, I think as in many other countries, and I probably we see similar patterns uh, across Europe, is of course COVID-19 had a massive impact on, on mobility. Um, for the public transport sector, we have 80 to 90 percent um, drop in passenger numbers during the intense phase of the lockdown. So um, that is, of course, has an effect on, on revenues, on ticket sales, on the economic situation of our uh, public transport providers. But um, what I think challenges us all most is that it had an effect on um, the question of confidence in the safety of public transport systems. And so this is, I think, is one of the things we need to, um, to confront on the way out of the crisis. The second is on rail, uh, on freight transport. Of course, we saw um, immense um, immense effects on on the, the the freight transport in general. What uh, worries me most is also that rail freight transport, uh, even though it was really stable during the crisis, even though when lorries were stopped at national borders, rail freight was uh, was up and running. We see that also here we have a drop in numbers which um, in an already very tense situation for rail freight, of course, is, um, is a serious issue to confront and to work with. And the third, and um, there I'm really looking forward to hear from Brussels, the third factor is, of course, um, our mobility forms changed. And we see that people um, really um, have a, a big need for feeling safe when being uh, mobile. And of course, there's one uh, way of doing that, that's to get on your bike or to walk. No issue at all with social distancing and uh, you, you uh, so active mobility, of course, that's a chance. But we also see in, we also see in Austria that, um, that one of the big effects is on the use of cars. And so, um, that, of course, is an issue not only because uh, for the quality of life in cities, but also for uh, navigating us directly into the... It seems we have lost Leonor for a second. I see the others, so I hope uh, Leonor will come back. William, you raise your hands. Okay, you're there. Leonor, do you hear us? Um, yes, it's clear we have a technical issue. Um, I propose we switch to Elke and hope we can fix the technical problem with Leonor uh, in meanwhile. Um, so, uh, hello, uh, Elke van der Nice you are with us. I uh, hope it will work. Um, if it's okay, I will share my screen so we can have a powerpoint but i'm afraid i don't hear you so i hope yes yes i hear you okay okay that's uh, because i have techno problems all day uh, as well so um in one hand, so talking about um, the Brussels Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan and especially linked to COVID and the exit of this crisis, um, I would like to share with you uh, some aspects, um, perhaps, and I was it's curious to hear the rest of the, the story of Leonor, but I can already start um, with uh, a part of it. So I will start with those, with, with a few numbers, eh, telling uh, what it's been like in, in, in Brussels for the moment. So uh, we are in a near complete lockdown since the 17th of uh, March. Um, not a complete lockdown, but, but as far as. And we're now starting the exit, the exit strategy. So our shops are reopening, schools are reopening. So during the, the, the lockdown period, there was about 55 to 90% less uh, of, of cars. Um, that's a large uh, scale, because in, on the main roads, on the main access, it was about half of the traffic on 
than on a regular day within the neighborhoods where people lived was up to 90 percent less cars so it was a difference um especially there in neighborhoods where people are living um we, we noticed that the, the car traffic almost dropped down same thing with the public transport we were about 10 to 15 percent um of the, the the people using it uh, the capacity was about half uh, not that we limited capacity we, we did all we could but we had some measurements on um, social distancing on the, the public transport, but also measurements to protect the, the drivers, the bus drivers and the, the, the tram drivers that, that made us lower the capacity um, during the COVID crisis. Um, in the beginning, we noticed also bike traffic diminution, but very, star very soon people started cycling, cycling and walking. So people are walking and cycling a lot in Brussels. I hope this means that we have some health uh, in encouragements as well. Um, and in the weekends, it's up to three times the, the amount of cyclists we have. And um, so it's, it's a huge increase. And we also see that now that we are restarting because we've been exiting now for a few days, we notice that people are using their bike far more for uh, roads, for um, commuting to, to work, which is an, an interesting um, aspect. Um, it's on the one hand, uh, we think it's um, because of the, the, the fear of, of the, the public transport. Um, people are a bit afraid of, of using public transport and we're also giving this message to people. If you can avoid using public transport, please do so because we need to keep um, the public transport for those who don't have an alternative because you can't have full buses or full trams. So it's, it, it, it hurts my, my heart to, to do a promotion saying, well, if you can avoid it, avoid it. But we do so in saying, please use your bike, go by foot if you can. And, and two thirds of the the placements in Brussels are for distance slower than five, lower than five kilometers. So we are convinced that we have a, we have a possibility to do a modal shift um, going to the bike or going to pedestrians. Um, since the, 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 the exit strategy, we noticed that there's a, a, a well, the road traffic is restarting, but we're not at the full capacity. And although we have more people using their car, probably because of the they are avoiding public transport we do not have an overcapacity in comparison to normal times we're still uh, below the the the, the general capacity the general traffic in um brussels so um we will see what it gives but we are um we are afraid of of a a, a mobile shift to the car we're afraid that people who are now who are before using public transport will now use their car so that is really are we really focusing on okay if you go for modal shift make a modal shift to uh, going by foot or uh, bye bye because that's the only way we can have a real exit you cannot exit uh, a health crisis by having more uh, traffic jams by having more air pollution by having more noise pollution and creating another health crisis so we really need to exit this health crisis with new habits and better habits and not by replacing it with other um, health problems that we know will occur if we just all go into our car not speaking of all the fact that we don't have a space to 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 accommodate all these cars so it will cause uh, even larger traffic jams than we already um, have um so we see now that there's a an, an start steadily an increase of of um traffic coming up um, and we'll monitor what it will give in the coming days uh, and weeks but what we know is that we really need action so we took some measurements um on different aspects and one of them is working with the neighborhoods as i told before we noticed that during the COVID crisis about 90 percent of the traffic in the the neighborhoods uh, dropped down but on the other hand, there was not more place for pedestrians and cyclists, although we have a lot of more pedestrians and cyclists in the neighborhood. So one of the first measurements we took was, was creating neighborhoods that could accommodate this. And um, this is actually by creating um, slow streets. It's um, the slow street is a street where uh, pedestrians have an absolute priority, where they can uh, take the whole of the, the space and they can um, they, they can take the middle of the road if they want to. They have this, this right within this slow street. Cars are allowed, but they can go maximum 20 kilometers an hour. And I think this is really important um, because looking for the best answer was also negotiating a bit with the, the, the emergency services. And they were saying, like, please do not close down too many roads because that means that we will have to find new roads and we just want to be able to drive through the city as we know it. So we needed to find an, an, a balance between this um, serious demands that we cannot ignore. On the other hand, creating neighborhoods with less um, less uh, impact of cars. And 
The example of Vienna was uh, for us very inspiring. Uh, the moment that Vienna started putting this slow street system in action, we said, okay, this is what we need in Brussels as well. Uh, this is the, 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 the basis we need um, to, to have uh, neighborhoods that are less impactful. So we created um, an offer to our communes because in Brussels we have different communes. And for the moment we have about, um, we have more than 100 kilometers of streets that are in this system, this slow street system, largely because of the, the central of Brussels whole pentagon which is the, the historical heart of brussels is in the system of slow street the whole historical center but next to that we also have about 25 um, kilometers now in different kind of zones also in very dense densely populated zones um, because we noticed that especially there there were a lot of um, conflicts between pedestrians on the sidewalks, conflicts between joggers and pedestrians, conflicts on the roads when there is a line before the bakery shop or anything. So we, we noticed that especially in the densely populated zones, we really needed to create, give some air, give some space uh, to people. And, and um, I see that there, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm about projects that are uh, into it. Um, if we did so, it was a temporary measure to respond to the, the health crisis, but it's not far from our um, mobility plan we had and that's always the, the balance we took it's like we're taking temporary measurements the philosophy we're using is actually the same philosophy as we have for our region on the long term so we do have a mobility plan it's called good move we just won the sump award for it from uh, from europe so we're very proud of it and um, so and it, it's it will define the mobility and, and all the public areas for the next the coming 10 years and in that plan, we already had the idea of creating 50 um, neighborhoods in which we would slow down the traffic, make sure that there was more place for people, for pedestrians, for um, encountering, for children playing. So the, the, the philosophy we use in having neighborhoods that are nice to live in, nice to be at, was something that was in the, the plan. And we translated it with the temporary measurements to respond to um, the challenges we, we encountered. So that was one of the first measurements um, we took. Um, and uh, another measurement um, we took is also diminishing the speed, making sure that people drive um, more slowly. That's also something that's on the long term plan and long term means from the 1st of January 22, the whole of Brussels will be at uh, 30 kilometers an hour, except for some exceptions. But the idea was already to, to, to reduce the speed in order to avoid um, um, accidents and road casualties. Um, and that's something that we saw was really, really necessary during this crisis, because although we have four, we, we almost had no traffic, the people in their cars who were driving were driving at incredible speeds. It was, you had empty streets and it's almost inviting you to, to go speeding. And that's the, the accidents, the number of accidents during COVID crisis was in comparison to normal periods higher than, 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 than otherwise just because of the, the impact of an accident whenever there was an accident because of, of speeding. So reducing speed is, is something that is really important to save lives also during this, this COVID um, crisis. Um, another measurement we took was, um, so on the one hand we work with neighborhoods, on the other hand we try to work with networks. So that's the, the two parts of the philosophy of our mobility plan. On the one hand creating slow neighborhoods, on the other hand creating networks for every mode of transport. We have a network for pedestrians, a network for cyclists, a network for cars, a network for uh, trucks and in that way having a smart idea of how to canalize uh, the traffic. Um, within that view, we, we had already some measurements taken. For example, the, the lights, the traffic lights were already centralized for a uh, part in the database, so we could control them easily from distance. And that way we could also um, make uh, lower, longer periods of green for pedestrians and cyclists. So very soon after one week, we changed the traffic light systems in order to give more green and longer green for pedestrians and cyclists, also where we could to avoid this little button you have to put to, to ask for a green light, so it would be automatically on a green light to avoid avoid um, touching buttons. So that's a, it was an easy measurement to take, but it was important and you, you can really feel it in the streets that some places really now have the time to cross the street and you don't have to wait as long as in normal times. And I have to admit that I hope to keep the lights like that. Perhaps we will have to make some adjustments, but it's not okay that only in COVID crisis times we have more time for cyclists and pedestrians. I think we need to, for some part, keep these measurements going on. Um, another thing, if you talk about network, is um, bicycle paths. So if we 
want to convince people to bike more and to go more by foot, we need to create pedestrian areas, but we also need to create cycling areas. Um, one of the main reasons why people in Brussels don't cycle a lot is um, the security and the, the, the idea that it's, and not the idea, but it's the reality that it's not safe to, to cycle in Brussels because we have a lack of infrastructure. And there has been some investments last uh, period, last 10 years, in, in creating new bicycle lanes. So you start to see them popping up everywhere, but um, they're not connected. We often have two kilometers of bicycle paths, down one kilometer, that's nothing, and then it starts again. But for cyclists, if you only, if only two thirds of your traject is, is secured, then you don't feel secured. So you really need to make a network, a connected network. And that's why we now focused on uh, creating 40 kilometers extra bike lanes, and especially connecting those missing links, making sure that there where there's a missing link, we, we, we speed up the, the measurements to connect those and we hope in that way to make really a, a shift to um to a bike and there's in brussels a lot of well, if you compare brussels to other cities like amsterdam or marseille or utrecht we see that the bike is really um underused and we really have a potential there um not only after COVID but in general we know that's that's where we have a lot to win um we'll see what it gives but plenty of people now say oh, i want to test those new bicycle lanes and that gives the the first um people are testing it say okay it works and perhaps i can go to work now and we hope in that way to accommodate um a model shift in brussels which is really urgent um of course we keep on investing in public transport um it's not that it's and that's the difficulty we say if you can go by foot or, or bike but we are trying to to have the 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 public transport for those who need it and many people need it half of the people in brussels do not own a car many of them do not own a bike so public transport is for many people the only way to to do a longer distance than by foot so we need to keep up um giving uh, extra cleaning making sure that the capacity is high enough uh, making sure that every measurement of safety is taken um, and last week we had a lot of, of actions of our um, public transport because they were afraid of the impact of, of the exit strategy and they're afraid of having full buses and everything so that it's a really difficult um, situation for the moment but we hope to offer as much as public transport as possible so those people who don't have an alternative, have a, a safe way of replacing yourself, have the possibility to keep social distancing on a bus, on a tram, um, and, and make sure that we continue uh, offering this public service. Um, we also do a lot of um, communication and making sure we, we have uh, all possible um, answers. Um, making sure the services for um, cyclists, making sure that the road map is in, in progress. So everything, the programs like Cycling for Beginners, uh, many people in Brussels don't know how to cycle or don't know how to cycle in a city because cycling in a city is something else than, than cycling on the countryside for, for pleasure. So this, these courses for Cycling for Beginners or learning to cycle or to bike in, in an urban context uh, are, if, um, are um, put in place at a higher um, risk with long wait lists for them, making sure that everybody who has a bike that needs to be repaired knows where they can go to, to have them repaired. So all these kind of measurements we could do to support um, bicycle use uh, were put in place uh, in the, these, these weeks and, and reopened again. Um, there are some communication campaigns. Today we start also a Bike for Brussels campaign on Keep on Cycling. Now we learn it, so that's an important part our COVID response in hoping to make this uh, model shift. I'm going a bit faster so that you can uh, afterwards ask some more questions. Um, and um, I think I would like to, to finish this, this overview of what we're doing in Brussels now by thanking our team because um, it's, it seems easy. And in the beginning, it's okay, just create some bicycle lanes, but it is incredible difficult to do something now because also in the administration also with all the entrepreneurs everywhere COVID crisis is active everywhere we have more people ill than in other times everywhere we have difficult measurements to work it's it's harder to to have meetings because everything is online and putting things in place is more difficult than ever but on the same time we are we are speeding up and saying now it's the time to act now we need to take some measurements so there's um, an incredible amount of effort being done um, within the administration, within the public transport, 
uh, to make everything possible. And I hope we, we will not forget that, that behind uh, some measurements that seem easy, there's already always a lot of hard work of people in very difficult um, circumstances. But um, in order not to talk too long and keep enough time for some um, question and um, remark, I will give uh, the room to okay. the next person, Dirk. Elke, thank you very much. It's really a great talk. It's really uh, gives us a, heart, a warm heart to see how all the things you are doing. And it's also good you mentioned that behind every measure, there are people working very hard. And one thing I already uh, note this is you said uh, Vienna is uh, a city of inspiration so this is the good connection to come back to Lyon. I'm very happy the technical things are uh, prepared so I'm happy to give you back the floor yeah I'm, I'm very sorry for this uh, interruption but so I got a chance to actually listen to the inspiring example of Brussels because I think that's exactly the, the best positive use that we can make out of these uh, European exchanges that we learn from each other's examples and also it's nice to see how ideas spread across Europe. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to pick back up where I left off. So um, I described a bit what was the effect of, of COVID on our transport and mobility system. So on public transport, on, um, on freight transport, rail freight, and also on the question of confidence in, in public transport and the increased use of cars. So um, maybe just to go quickly into, into um, the two other points I wanted to mention, the first question is what did we do as an emergency response on the one hand side? And now what do we need to do uh, for the short, medium and long term to um, get back on track towards uh, a sustainable mobility system in many ways? So um, how did we respond in the first place? So of course, um, one of our main uh, tasks was to keep public transport up and running. That's also what Elke just um, described. So we did worked a lot with emergency contracts. We we made sure that operators um, cooperated on the rail system, and so that we really were able to keep up um, train and public transport services at all time uh, in all situations, and keep um, a backbone of of public transport mobility. Of course, in at the moment we um, we started opening up, so we are now um, also almost completely back up and running so it's uh the of course pressure on on public transport people coming back the the fears that come with it are is it safe to use public transport we also had to respond to that so of course we went back to normal timetables on on public transport even we are not yet back to normal passenger numbers but so we increased the the um the the frequency again of the services we also increased a lot um, cleaning desinf disinfection on public train train and and um, and public transport services. So also to restore confidence that it's a safe environment. And what we also did, we came up with a code of conduct. Uh, I have no better uh, translation for it, I fear, um, which we developed together with um, the operators and the trade unions to make sure. Um, to have some simple guidelines and rules um, that if you want to or need to use public transport, what to do. Yeah, what simple rules apart from the legal obligation to wear a mask. We introduced that in all public uh, public transport services, but also simple behavioral rules that that can increase um, and can help all of us using public transport to to feel safe and to also use it safely. We tried to avoid uh, saying don't use public transport if you don't have to. So we, uh, what we did instead was uh, two things. On the one hand side, of course, to, to encourage um, uh, companies to um, still keep people in home office. So to, and to enable flexible work time wherever possible so that the, the main a challenge to avoid peak hours in public transport can be um, can be uh, more easily handled, and uh, we also did that, for example, with schools. 
schools are taking shifts. We only have half of the students back in schools every day. So there's two shifts of students, which also eases pressure on public transport. And uh, apart from that, of course, uh, you cited the example, we tried to do everything that we could from a national level to uh, to make it easier for people to keep the distance when walking and cycling. So slow roads, um, as you as you mentioned, we changed the traffic code to to actually make that that possible. And and some of the uh, some of the other things that um, that many other cities did, but I'm really impressed by the Brussels example. Um, so um, congratulations, what you what you managed to do there. Um, of course, we also uh, on on freight transport, we increased subsidies. We made sure that we keep systems in place for the time after the crisis because this is exactly what we need. We need a strong public uh, transport backbone, a strong freight transport backbone for the mobility systems of the future. So we need to make sure that these um, these systems actually survive and survive in a, in a good state uh, these weeks of and, and months of crisis. Which kind of leads the way uh, to um, the way out of this crisis. Um, in many countries, I think all over Europe and also in the European Union, of course, the discussion shifts now to the question of um, what kind of stimulus packages do we need? How do we get people back to work? Um, also in Austria, we have high numbers of unemployment. We have a lot of uh, people on more than a million people on reduced work time. Um, so the question on how to both get out of the labor market and the economic crisis and to use this opportunity now to confront the climate crisis. That's what, what really keeps us busy at the moment. So we're just now designing our Austrian economic stimulus package, where uh, one of the key aspects will be to invest in, um, in future-proof infrastructure. Uh, so that, of course, means train infrastructure. That, of course, means um, um, also um, um, cycling infrastructure um, and everything that we need as a as a backbone for our uh, future mobility systems. And I speak a lot these days about the double or triple dividends that we can get um, out of these measures. We create jobs locally. If we build train tracks in Austria, 70 to 80 percent of the business goes to uh, small and medium enterprises in Austria. So it's it's really something that stimul stimulates local economy and, and and employment in the region. We create and, and safeguard future-proof jobs because we will need a lot of these <laughs> uh, uh, in the future. And um, we guarantee infrastructure that we need in the future to, especially also in the regions. That's a um, that's a big focus that we have. Um, to in in making sure we reach our goal towards climate neutrality 2040. So um, that's that's something we um, we do a lot uh, in in terms of uh, infrastructure, but also in terms of immobility uh, of transport needs for rural areas. A lot of focus on research and innovation at the moment, but. Um, there is one nexus that you asked me to comment on between emergency uh, response and uh, long-term um, pathway. That's, of course, in the airline industry. We have, um, as all the all the carriers across Europe, they are grounded. Um, Austrian Airlines is grounded and um, applied for state aid for um, around 800 million euro from the Austrian state, which is um, a lot of money. I don't need to say that. So um, we have um, rules for emergency aid and we gave out a lot of emergency aid at the moment to make sure that small businesses around the corner that had to close down survive this crisis. But of course, if we if we look at, um, at one company that needs several hundred million euros state aid and is a company that's challenged a lot in terms of, of climate crisis, then we were very clear also in the Austrian government, this needs conditionality. So um, we have um, de defined basically three, three sets of conditions. The, the one is, of course, that, um, that uh, the, the question of uh, a future transport system and the role that 
uh, air traffic has in that uh, for an um, economic area like Vienna, like uh, like Austria. We, there needs to be a, a perspective on what is that what is that role. We need a perspective for safe jobs in a sector that's currently uh, competing on unsafe and uh, dumped uh, social dumping jobs. Yeah, so that's uh, the second the second uh, thing. And the third area is um, is the question of uh, of climate action because uh, no need to say airline industry is uh, especially challenged by uh, a pathway towards climate neutrality. And there's uh, several things we're currently discussing. Uh, of course, um, also here, I don't need to say um, modal shift towards train wherever possible on short haul flights is one of the questions, but also techno technological solutions, the regulatory framework. I think there's a lot of things that we can do now and where we can do things right at this point in time, even though it's a difficult point in time, even though the industry is challenged, but if we, waste the chance now i think it becomes much more difficult in the future and i've been very clear on that but uh from the beginning on but i'm very happy to see that actually with the deal in france with the deal between air france and the french state we now have an example of uh, how it can be done also in practice um which is uh i think or can be an example also for many for many other countries in our case we will still be negotiating for that uh, for some time i fear there will be no quick solution because it's a um complicated <laughs> complicated negotiation and um it's also um if there will be a solution i cannot uh, say at the moment but if there is a solution it needs to be one that can um that um is good for safe jobs and is good for um, a pathway towards clim a climate neutrality. And I'll leave it with that because otherwise uh, we for sure have no time for questions. Okay, uh, Leonor, thank you very much for your contribution. I think it's very important what you said that uh, this is the time to uh, fix the current problems, but also to install the infrastructure for the future. So your example of uh, you will Tra tracks that also provide jobs in the region is really, a, I think, a very inspiring example. And now I'm very happy to give the floor to William to, uh, from, let's say, a point of view of an NGO to give a comment on mobility in this crisis and also especially what, how can we make mobility more sustainable after this crisis. So, William, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, thanks a lot for for inviting me, and thanks for you know focusing the discussion on transport. Uh, I think it's an excellent choice, not not just because it's my you know my my job, but also because I think genuinely a lot of extremely interesting things are happening in the decisions uh, that people like Leonora and others will be taking in the next two three months are going to determine whether we you know, whether we can be successful in the transport transformation in in the next years or not. What I would like to do in the you know in the next uh, couple of minutes is, is zoom in on on what I think are the three most prominent topics. One the first one is is cities. Basically, the question is can we can we keep the skies blue? Can we you know can we make some of those temporary measures? Can we make them permanent? Then go to aviation and then finally talk about the, the car industry, which is uh, calling for a, a lot of uh, public support. Maybe we can start with with cities, and I you know I, I'm I'm. I live in Brussels, so I, I listened with great interest to, to uh, Minister van den Brandt, and uh, I've, I've been really impressed with what she's been doing. And I think the starting point for, for, for many of us on this call is that over the last two months, I think we have seen what life in a city could or should be like. You walk around, you know, you walk around, there's no pollution, there's no congestion. You can cycle around with your, with your baby uh, behind you, and you're not afraid. You're actually enjoying it. And this is it's not just important because you know it, 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 it's pleasant and it's less pollution it's also important because cities are you know cities are from a climate perspective the perfect place for people to live so it is in our common interest to make cities livable spaces and, and make cities successful now i think we need to realize that what's happened over the last two months and, and now the exit phase, that none of this is structural. People will want to go back to normal. People, you know, there's 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 a great desire in business and in, in our own lives to go back to back to normal, to the way things were before. 
And I think if you look at what's happened in places like, like Wuhan, where all of this started, you see that actually because of you know the concerns people have around public transport that the rise that there's a huge rise in in in, in car traffic in, in in motor traffic and that the model share of cars in places like wuhan has increased very significantly and i think over you know in in the next two three months we you know we have a big fight on our hands to to essentially you know and, and it's a big word but to avoid a congestion and pollution hell when you know when when all these measures are lifted and i, I think in a way the reopening of the schools after summer, uh, which in, in this country is the 1st of September, is D-Day, because that's the moment where, you know, where hopefully the pandemic will be temporarily under control and when life returns to normal. At that moment, I think we need to, we need to make sure that these temporary measures, that they become permanent. And we're going to be doing, so we're, you know, we're, we're an NGO, but we also do a lot of, a lot of, lot of research and we're going to do, um, a lot of modeling to, to figure out for, for all those cities, like places, places like Brussels, but also Paris, Berlin, London, um, Valencia, and, and also places in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Try and try and figure out sort of what, what are your options and, and what mix of measures is going to allow you to contain both the, you know, to satisfy both the health needs, the mobility needs and the pollution needs. I think, you know, I think we, we, we actually have quite a, a unique opportunity to accelerate a trend that has been going on for, for 30, 40 years. And the hope is that you know, come September and, and the months after that, that we emerge in, in what is a new normal in European cities. That is, I think, what we will be working for as, as, as the transport and environment movement with our members. Now let's turn to the, the aviation industry. It would be easy to, you know, to, to think that the aviation industry is on its knees um, across Europe, and across the world, actually, they are asking for public money. This is a sector that always prided itself on, you know, they, they were liberalized, they didn't need anybody's help. You know, they, we are the airlines. Now they are begging for public money to survive. And there's no, there's no schadenfreude here. They are, they, they are indeed very, very hard hit and they employ lots of people. So it's not something to be pleased about. What I think we should realize, though, is that the airline industry has an, an, an incredible ability to rebound. And if you look at what's happened in, in the last you know, 60, 70 years since, since commercial aviation really took off after the Second World War, there have been so many crises. And every time the airline industry was hit, and for a few years it was a problem, but they always bounced back. And I think below the surface, what's happening right now, um, you know, I, I think you know, we, I heard the minister talk about the importance of social rights, good, good working conditions. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think as part of the bailout discussions, a whole number of airlines are going to restructure and they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to try to improve their bottom line to survive in what is going to be an extremely tough economic environment in the next two, two, three years. And that means that you're actually looking at a Ryanairization of the airline industry and Ryanairized, you know, that's not a word, but, you know, a, a Ryanair style aviation sector is going to be extremely lean and is, you know, in two, three years time, they'll be back. So I think it is absolutely true what the minister said is that we need to seize the moment. You know, we come out of out of a period where there was a lot of um, lot of pressure on the airline industry, both at national and at European level. Now is the moment to say, guys, if you want money, you'll have to pay tax. Um, and, you know, a number of good things have happened, for example, in Austria, but we can do more. They, just, they still don't pay kerosene tax. And, and I think what is also really important, we need a pathway towards decarbonized flying because flying is not going to disappear, you know, whether we like that or not. And that means that we need to push the airlines and, and the aviation industry on the use of zero emission fuels, of sustainable alternative fuels. And that requires regulation. And I think now is the moment to, to make that very clear to the industry. I think if we do that, we might actually arrive at a, you know, we might actually look back at 2020 in a couple of years time as, as the moment where European aviation emissions peaked. And I think that is, that is unique in itself because, you know, I, I don't think uh, many of us would have expected that, so that, that this would have been possible just three months ago. <laughs> Turning to the, the car industry, the car industry is, of course, you know, the, the aviation industry has, and the shipping industry, they, they you know, they are, they are very fast growing, but the car industry and personal mobility is responsible for the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector. And they're the ultimate climate sinner in a way. For 25 years, we've been talking about the need to move to a different type of mobility, smaller cars, more efficient cars. 
but what we got was Dieselgate. And so the good news was that in the last few years, there were a number of glimmers of hope. I think Dieselgate was, was in Europe was, was really a turning point. It was, I think, the end of the car industry's iron grip on political on the political system and on policy making. I think another really important thing that happened is the rise of, of Tesla. And you know, I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not a great fan of uh, of Elon Musk and, and his Twitter <laughs> tirades, but it is true that what he has done is he's, he's shown that there is an alternative to the combustion engine. Similarly, what China has done over the last five to ten years, a determined industrial policy uh, away from the combustion engine, has shown the Germans, the French, that there, you know, that that this might actually be the future of the car industry to move away from the combustion engine. And I think, you know, the, the I think all of this culminated in a number of countries announcing that they want to move away from the combustion engine. Even places like Spain, with a big car industry, places like France, places like the UK, where they, where they, where they were talking about bringing forward the, the end date for the combustion engine. And so, you know, there was. Actually, there was a glimmer of hope for the first time. I, I've been with TNE for ten years. In the last years, for the first time, we thought we can actually we, we can actually do this. We can actually decarbonize the car industry. Now, of course, with the whole Corona crisis, the, the political context changes. These you know million you know hundreds of thousands of people are out of work. The car industry is a big employer, and they'll be calling for support. And they'll they'll do what they do best, which is uh, to pretend that they are you know that they are they're victims and that they are in need of lots of support. I think the key thing for us to do in, in, in this you know in this new political context is I want to recognize that the car industry is an important industry and that they will, just like other industries, need to be supported in the recovery phase. But the, the support needs to be targeted and it needs to be conditional. The first and most important condition is that the car industry needs to comply with all CO2 and other environmental regulations that we've adopted in the, la in the last years. And the most important of those is the European car CO2 regulation. And that is the, the regulation that is driving essentially investment in electric vehicles in, in Europe. And, you know, the car, the car lobbies have already started saying, oh, you know, couldn't you, couldn't you postpone this a little bit? It needs to be very clear. You can get support. You can, you can get loans if you have liquidity needs. But the condition is you comply with the regulations. We're also going to strengthen regulations as part of the European Green Deal. Plus, the money that you get, you'll invest it in the future, not in the past. I think if we do that, we can, you know, we can we can actually accelerate the transition. I think I'm, I'm already speaking speaking quite long, so I will not, you know, spend too much time on the scrappage schemes. But this is one of the one of the most, uh, you know, prominent discussions at this time. In Germany, in Spain, in France, uh, in, in, in many countries across Europe, the car industry is calling for billions of euros in public support to buy new cars. There's a leaked document from the, from the Commission that suggests that the Commission is considering spending uh, 20 billion euros on car purchasing in uh, 2021 and 2020. This would be 2022. This would be the biggest car purchasing, public park car purchasing program um, that uh, the world has ever seen, I think. Fundamentally, scrappage schemes are a bad idea. They are they're they're not the way they're not the way we should be spending our money because you know it's 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 a short term plaster on the economy, but it doesn't structurally change you know strengthen the economy in the long run. But I think and you know, I think we also need to recognize that you know this is what we did during the last crisis and it's likely that it will happen again. So directing this type of support to the right type of vehicles and and, and certainly you know. Making sure that it doesn't go to polluting SUVs. I think this is a big part of the of, of the fight of, of the coming months. So I wanna, you know, I wanna I wanna keep it at that. And I, I just a few words, words of conclusion. First, I wanna I wanna reiterate what I said at the beginning. I think it's really all to play for in the next in the next two, three months. Uh, when it comes to, to bailouts, to the airline industry, uh, when it comes to the car industry, to to our cities, there's so much at stake. I think we have a great opportunity. I think this crisis could be an accelerator, but it depends on the choices that we make. But last not but least, not but, le not, but not least, we we need to act fast, we need to act boldly, but we also should not forget that you know this is not just good, you know it's not just an opportunity. This is a huge economic crisis and it's affecting millions of people in a really you know in, in a really terrible way. And I think as Europeans we need to we need to understand that certain countries 
are more affected than others and that we'll need a degree of solidarity to help those countries emerge from the crisis because i think you know we can we can dream of a european green deal of new regulations of, of climate neutrality in 2040 2050 but i think it's going to be hard to build that dream on an economic ruin in the south um, and so in that sense the the Franco-German proposal for a uh, 500 billion euro recovery fund and, 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 and the proposal that the Commission is making next week for a hopefully a green recovery is going to be extremely, extremely important because that's, you know, it's 500 billion euros that can be invested in the places that need it and also in, in the future, in, in, in a green recovery. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, William. Uh, I uh, think what you said is very important. Uh, the coming two, three months are really crucial for what kind of direction we want to steer our society. I mean, meanwhile, I'm very happy. A lot of questions are coming in the chat box. I have a first one for uh, Elke. It's concerning the bicycle lanes. People are asking, will they be permanent, the cycle lanes you have now installed? So it's Sorry, Dirk, I didn't hear you. Um, okay, I will. This, whether it's as permanent, eh, the bicycle lanes? People are wondering these new cycle lanes and also some closure of some roads, are they permanent? Yes and no. So, on the one hand, for the bicycle lanes, on the one hand, we took all the plans we had uh, to put them in place. So, from some places, we knew we wanted to put a bicycle lane. We already started up making those plans. So, those will be. First temporary, but BTI made them permanent. On some places, it's really temporary measurements. We have some places where we, we just took a, a, a car lane, we'll put a, a bicycle lane, and we know that it can't stay like that in a permanent basis. But because we work on um, a network that we already identified before, so in our mobility plan, we already identified the main network we needed for bicycle lanes. And because we're working on those, we know that within this, within this uh, political term, we will put some de permanent infrastructure on those uh, lanes. But the, you can go fast in process, we can go fast with temporary measurements, but if you want to do something permanent, we need permissions and we need, there's uh, several procedures we need to go through, but I hope that if they are a success, they can stay and so far they are a success. I, I have no knowledge of a bicycle lane that was put in place and didn't attract bicycles. So if it's, not necessary to make it permanent, we won't do so, but I'm quite convinced that they will become a permanent um, or that we, there will be a demand to make them permanent. Um, that's why we always we already, always started with our long-term plan, our mobility plan, and took measurements that were fine with that, so that we know that although it's me temporary measurements, we know we have a, a permanent answer on the long term as well. Okay, thanks. There's another question, uh, I think, for Leonor, but maybe also for William. It's on um, the state aid for airlines with a declining CO2 ceiling, and it's focusing on the use of which kind of fuels, biofuels. If we use biofuels, there's a risk that global food security will be undermined. Wouldn't it be wiser to impose the use of synthetic fuels made of hydrogen? and renewable electricity. So, uh, yeah, this is a question on what kind of fuels uh, airplanes have to use in the future to become sustainable. Maybe, William, I'll start and you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. because I, I would want, I wanted to react to something you said also uh, on the airline industry anyway. The question: Perfect. What is what's the what's the future of the airline industry, and do we have a Ryanair style uh, airline sector or not? And uh, of we have Ryanair in Vienna Airport, and Vienna Airport is a very competitive air, uh, airport. We have uh, Austrian Airlines, Lufthansa, but we have a lot of low cost carriers as well. And Ryanair already announced they will come back uh, with a ninety nine cent flight uh, from uh, flight offers from Vienna. So going to wherever, Brussels, London, Paris for 99 cents. So, of course, that cannot be the future of, uh, of, of flying and of the industry. So, um, what, what makes me um, hopeful, though, even though it's going to be tough discussions, it's going to be no easy solutions, is that especially in this crisis, we have seen what um, 
state regulation and what a regulatory framework and um, can do also in a short term um, can do and how important it is that we that we uh, that that we act also as a state as politicians so if we uh, take money in our hands to support one company then at the same time we need to make sure that the regulation and the, the regulatory framework that we set for the sector and there is only so much we can do nationally yeah but what we can do nationally uh to actually do so in order to support a, also a future business model for the industry that uh, as a business model also in social terms can be uh can be sustainable and of course there's a lot of pressure on social rights there's a lot of pressure on labor standards but that's why I insist that any part of of deal uh, with the airline industry also needs to have that very strongly in mind because we have a total cost for society for these bailouts and that's also the costs that we have in terms of uh, of uh, the situation on 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 for the employees uh, in terms of um, of fuels, um, yeah, of course, um, I, I, the, the problems that the person who asked the question are are there uh, very clearly. So, in in our case, we're thinking more um, in the direction of synthetic fuels, uh, but um, at the same time, also there we have to acknowledge it's not um, it's not endless in supply. We uh, the we need. Uh, the, the 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 energy to also produce them um in the end it needs to be renewable energy so i mean it's 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 also there we have uh, systemic limits to to what we can do so everything we can do now and also there i would really like to support william the next months are crucial and um that to to actually um Get the model shift right, draw from some of the lessons that we've learned, like we're doing now an international conference in video conferencing. So um, to actually um, draw from some of the lessons that we had also in, in terms of, of mobility patterns and behavior to actually move forward and not back to the future, actually go to the future and not back to the future. Something else, sorry, I have to say, the Green Deal is not a dream. <laughs> I think it's a necessity and I think we need to label it as such also. But um, I, I, I know we wanted to doubt the question that this needs a lot of solidarity to actually put it in place. Okay, thanks. Um, I see we again have a kind of technical issue because at this moment I only see Leonor and now she's disappearing. So oh, she's back and William is also back. We can still hear you. That's fine. So, William, I give you the floor for this question on uh, airplanes and fuels. I think it, I mean it's, it's an it's an it's an excellent question. Um, I think this, the starting point is that we should indeed shift short haul flights to to rail wherever we can and 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 to other options. But we need to acknowledge that the vast majority of emissions caused by by aviation are are, are not short haul emissions. The vast majority is is long haul emissions and. If we're going to you know, oblige companies like Air France to abandon their short haul flights, that's going to cut their emissions by less than 1%. Um, actually, in the case of Air France, our calculations suggest 0.3%. So that, that's very limited. Um, that's not, not to say that we shouldn't pursue it. We should definitely pursue it. But we need the fuels. We need, we, so we need the fuels to decarbonize the long haul flights. Clearly, those fuels cannot be cannot be um, crop based biofuels um, for fuel security reasons, but not just for food reasons. Also, just from a land use perspective, it is it is irresponsible to be using to be using good agricultural land to grow stuff grow stuff that we're then going to burn. That is, you know, that that is in a world with with a growing population that is just that. that's just that's not not the way forward. There's a limited potential for so-called advanced biofuels that are based on wastes and residues, but that is really a very limited potential because those wastes and residues are already being used in, in, in other sectors. And, and obviously, you know, we want less, less waste, uh, not more waste in the future. So it is true that the, you know, the, 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 the sort of the one remaining credible option to decarbonize aviation are indeed synthetic fuels, but as, as the minister has said, uh, it is it is also not a perfect uh, or easy easy solution. It's true. It's uh, it's you, know, you need lots of renewable energy to produce those. Um, it is it is inefficient, but I think you know, it is the only it is the only 
conceivable technological pathway. So we need to pursue it. If we, you know, if we take the Paris Agreement seriously, we need to pursue it. But I also think that simultaneously, we need to keep pushing the aviation industry and, then in particular, the builders of aircraft to invest in to, to innovate. And companies like Airbus are receiving billions of dollars in subsidies, and they're going to receive billions of euros in indirect subsidies because comp governments are going to uh, ask their, their companies to renew their fleet and buy new aircraft from Airbus. You know, some, there should be conditions there as well. Um, you know, when, when are we finally going to see some investment in hydrogen aircraft? Why is um, Airbus abandoning its hybrid aircraft plans? So it, it's, it's a combination of, yeah, it's a combination of measures, but we'll need, ultimately, personally, I believe we'll need, we'll need innovation as well. Or stop flying. Okay, I have here a question which uh, is more on the city level or maybe also on the national level. Um, it's inspired by what happened in Luxembourg. Should governments go as far as making public transport free to discourage individual car use? So, Elke and Leonor, what's your, view, your take on this? Um, Elke, do you okay. want to start? Yeah, please. Elke, you take the floor. I'm sorry, I have a bad connection. So the last part I had was uh, whether we cities we should on have a politics on reducing cars. Eh? That was the, the question. Yeah, the, the, I'm very sorry. The, the question was, should we do the same as in Luxembourg, make public transport free? Yeah, in Brussels, there's a huge debate on, on making public transport free. Um, for the moment, it's a budgetary question as well. If we make it free, it would cost us a lot of money, which um, we cannot invest in something else. And we also have done some studies and impact studies where the results were um, that if we would make it free, it would put people who normally bike or walk onto the public transport. So it would not have a model shift from cars to public transport, but a model shift from active modes to public transport. And um, with all the love for the public transport that I have, that's not the, the way we want to go. We want to encourage people by car doing the way for public transport or by foot or by cycling. But those who are cycling and walking, let's keep on continue to convince them to cycle and walk. So we have a policy of very cheap um, subscriptions for certain um, people. So those people who are who live in poverty can have a, a subscription for eight euros um as as for the whole public transport but we do not want to make it for free for everybody because we think that's uh, would, uh have an, an, a reverse impact on the model shift we're trying to achieve we also want to make it for free uh for youngsters for people until 25 years old so that before they buy their first car we promote it as much as possible but the the general um um price the the, the general general um uh, free public transport is not considered as the, the best option for Brussels for the moment. I hope that's okay. a clear can, answer. Yes, thank you for your answer. I can maybe just add very quickly to that because our thinking goes uh, a bit in the same direction. So what we are doing, I think, is basically three pillars. We want to encourage a modal shift. So what do we need? We need better infrastructure, be it in train infrastructure, be it also decarbonized bus fleets and whatever comes with it so but better infrastructure better frequency so reliability efficiency um, making sure that there is a um, uh, integrated uh, frequency where in every that's our plan in every uh, community in Austria you have a public transport um, uh, connection once an hour and the third pillar is of course affordability and so one of the key projects of this government is a is an Austrian wide flat rate ticket for all public transport. And so we're working very hard in the ministry to actually make that a reality by uh, next year. And the key idea is that uh, in, in one of the regions in Austria, you can use all public transport for one euro per day uh, on, a, on a yearly basis. So 365 euros for two euros a day 
uh, you can use um, uh, you you have public transport systems in two provinces and the nationwide ticket for three euros a day so a bit more than 1000 uh, euros to use all the public transport in europe that's one of the key uh, in europe that would be nice in austria <laughs> so that's one of the key projects of this uh, legislature and we're working very hard because um it's service quality but it's also service affordability that um will maybe help us make the shift in our minds in terms of what is fixed costs for transport. Currently, people usually think car is fixed cost. So you pay for what the car costs and that's your month monthly mobility um, budget. And then you pay for extra trips or for the train trip or whatever. And we need to reverse that. We need to make sure that the public transport is your fixed cost. So that is affordable enough so that a monthly ticket for all the public transport, a yearly ticket for the public transport, that's your fixed mobility costs. Then once you need a car, you share one, you rent one, you get one. But I think to make public transport more affordable will also help us to make that shift in how we look at transportation costs. And that will get us a long way. Okay, thanks uh, for this uh, clear explanation. There's another question uh, concerning the decarbonization of the car industry and the shift from uh, fossil fuel cars to electric cars. So how can we stimulate the demand of electric cars or hydrogen cars to meet climate goals? So maybe William, you can start uh, first giving an answer. Okay, that's a, that, that, that's a, a short question uh, with, with with a long answer, but I'll, I'll 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 try to stick to a few points. I think there's there's two there's two fundamental things. On the one hand, it's it's about supply. If you went into a showroom three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, and you told your car dealer that you wanted to buy an electric Volkswagen, an electric Peugeot, or whatever, they would have told you, no, sorry, we don't we don't actually have those models. And even if they in theory sold those models, they were unfortunately not available. And the reason for that is that the currency for a very long time actually did not want to sell those, those cars because they like selling internal combustion engine cars, which is what they have done for the last 100 years. So forcing the car makers to make those vehicles, to invest in those vehicles, to build those vehicles and to sell those vehicles is the first and I think most important, important pillar. Once we have, a, you know, once you can go to your dealer and you can buy the ID3 which is the electric electric version of, of the Golf at around the same price of the Golf, then you know the sort of transition to electric vehicles becomes a lot easier. You, you can't subsidize your way to, you know, to if, if the vehicles cost sixty thousand euros uh, compared to a, a fifteen twenty thousand euro diesel petrol car, you can't compete. But you know we're we're getting to closer to cost parity. The second thing is the second thing is of course tax. People's choice of car is by and large, uh, determined by the cost, the purchase cost. People don't think about how much they will be spending on road tax, annual road tax. They don't think about how much they will be, will be spending on fuel. They only look at the price of the vehicle when they buy it. So a system like a bonus malus system, where you pay more for a diesel or petrol car, depending on how it's high its emissions are, you get a bonus for buying an electric car. This is you know, proven to be the most effective way to guide people towards electric vehicles at the point of, of purchase. And then of course, once you've got an electric car, you're gonna be using it for seven years. And then after seven years, you're very unlikely to wanna go back to petrol or diesel because you know, you've made the investment to charging, you're used to it. Third point is charging. Um, that is of course, extremely important, especially in, a, in an urban environment. Uh, so we need to make it extremely easy for people to install charging infrastructure um, in, 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 in condominiums, in apartment blocks. And this is not just about money. It's also about uh, administrative rules, about uh, the fireman telling you that you can't install more than one charging point. These types of rules uh, will, 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 you know, will need to be changed if we want to quickly transition to, to electric vehicles. So I think th those, I would say, are, are three key, key blocks. And I'll add, one, I'll add a fourth, and that's company cars. 50% of cars in Europe are sold to companies. Company, co companies care about total cost of ownership, not purchase costs. Electric cars are perfect for companies. Um, so, you know, this, this is the market where, where you can make most progress 
quickest. And this is also a market that is extremely sensitive to fiscal signals. So I would say if you want to go, if you want to go fast on electric cars, uh, look at company cars. Okay, thanks. I want to invite Hero or Elke to uh, also contribute to this question. I don't think I need to add a lot because a lot has been said. Maybe one aspect uh, to just add on the company car question. And, and we are, of course, working on the question of fiscal incentives in that direction. Uh, but also we're looking to go one step further for fleets like the taxi fleet or um, uh, car sharing fleets. Everything that brings electric mobility into anything that's fleet will also uh, be in a will go directly into a used car market. And of course, once we have a used car market for electric vehicles, we also um, we, we it goes a lot faster to actually um, to actually have um, electric cars um, as a as a standard option also in that market. So I can um, agree to everything that that uh, William has said, a lot of the things we're trying to work on at the moment in Austria. Okay, thanks. Uh, Elke, I, I'm sure you're dreaming of Brussels with less cars, but then probably also more electric cars, if there are cars. I think I, I want to take up on the first one, because of course we prefer electric cars to um, fuel cars, but on the other hand, replacing all the existing cars by electrical cars will not solve all our problems. We will still keep having congestions and, and huge congestions and, and having uh, road security issues. So um, focusing on shared cars and on, on uh, less ownership of cars is something that we really continue on focusing on. Um, and we see the shift is going on and half of the, the, the households in Brussels does not own a proper car. We see it as a um, a rising interest in, in shared cars, which is very important for the, the traffic jams, but also for public space. We have a lot of public space in Brussels that is provided for the, the single use of cars, parking spaces and, and car lanes. And 70% of the public space in Brussels is now for parking space or by a car space. And if, if you want to create a city where it's more place for people, where you have more bike lanes, more, um, more pedestrian areas, we will need to make other choices. So, um, a shared car can provide for around 15 families. So um, pressing on these, these alternatives is something that we will do. But that's the first part of your question, Dirk. The second is if we do have cars, there will always be cars in Brussels or still for a few years. Let's make them electrical. I, I think I can agree on that one. The air pollution in Brussels is a real problem and um, the health issues concerned with that as well. So making sure that we invest in it. And what helped a lot, we noticed, is the directive that the European Commission took in saying that the, the car producers, they need to have um, for the whole production of all their cars, they have this, this goal of, I think, 93 um, um, emission uh, limit. And that makes that they need to sell a lot of, of uh, zero emission cars. And it um, makes the car uh, creators, the, the car, um, the, the fabrics, create cars that are affordable. And I think that's really important because if you have to pay 50,000 euros to buy an electric car, it's not for the, the general uh, public in Brussels. I don't know about uh, the other countries, but we, we do need to have some affordable um, pricing also for the, the general public. I do agree on everything that's been said on the fleet and company cars, but working on this individual car and making sure that they have an affordable price category is something that's only now coming up. We see now the Zoe and some of the cars coming up that are affordable for the general public. So um, that helped a lot. And, and we think that this European uh, directive behind it is, is pushing a lot while it's not, there's not huge communication about it, but we, we do see the difference. Um, and one thing we need to work on as a, as a Brussels government is, is providing the charging infrastructure. We, we have a lack of charging infrastructure in, in Brussels. So we're now putting a, um, a turbo on uh, creating public charging infrastructure because many people live on apartments do not have their own uh, garage or their own uh, place to charge their car so making sure that in the public space or in in um in shops and or, or park parks par car parks they are um born to to um, charge your car is something that we need to invest as well as as a region okay thank you very much um Although I know we are all in favor of uh, slow mobility, this session went very fast. So we are already uh, have around, have around, arrived at the end of uh, this uh, very interesting uh, talk. I want to thank all three of you, Leonor, 
Elke en William, I'm sure we could have a second session and who knows within a few months uh, when things are getting better and we have more uh, railway tracks in Austria and more cycle lanes in Brussels, maybe we can have another talk. But at this moment, uh, thank you very much and uh, I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks for having this discussion. Bye-bye to Brussels. That was great. Thank you. And uh, good luck to you both, Elke and Leonore. Thank you. Too. Keep Stay on pushing. Thanks for this interesting uh, organization. And uh, let's hope we meet again uh, in real life somehow in yeah. the near future. We're allowed to go out again. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the recording has stopped. So we're not live anymore.